Thanks everybody for coming. Um, yeah, like uh, Eli said, I work at a company called Benevolent, and that's not our real name, but uh, we produce a couple products. Peer Giving is one of them, and uh, Peer Giving is a software solution for charities to help them fundraise online. And the other is Chimp. It's a uh, um, a way for everyday people to get involved and make charity a habit in their life. So uh, you've got that all set up. Thanks. Uh, so tonight I'm talking to you about metrics that matter. And uh, first slide I want to show you here. Uh, how many people have seen this this screen before? Yeah. How many people use Google Analytics on a on a daily basis, regular basis, monthly? Yeah. Okay. Few people. Yeah. Uh, so. This screen is interesting because um, it's the first page you see when you open up Google Analytics. Uh, but the interesting part about it is that there's actually nothing interesting on it. And um, nothing here is actually helpful. Um, everything you see here doesn't help you make a better decision. Uh, it doesn't help you, uh, yeah, it, it doesn't help you decide what you're gonna do in the future. So, you know, if you take um, average visit duration, how long should uh, your average visit duration be? Anybody know? There's no, there's no answer. Um, and how many page views is good or bad? Okay, yeah, that's good. Um, so first lesson, there's nothing useful on the screen, just skip it. Uh, tonight we're actually going to be talking uh, in vague terms. Uh, we're not going to be focusing in on a specific tool like Google Analytics or Kissmetrics or um, any of the others that you've heard. It's going to be tool agnostic and that's purposeful because I find that people get bogged down in the tools that they're using and um, without really knowing why um, they're using them. Starting something here. Um, so this is going to be the overview of what we're talking, to, talking about tonight. I want to talk a little bit more about Vanity Metrics, which is basically the Google Analytics homepage. Uh, then we're going to talk about the alternative to that, which is actionable metrics. These are two uh, terms coined by Eric Ries from the Lean Startup. Uh, and then the next, I'm going to show you some testing frameworks that we can use. So once we've decided what our metrics are, what the good, the, the good honest metrics that we sh you should use on a daily basis to track, uh, how do we actually use these to make better decisions? And then finally, um, just going to talk about people, real people, and why they matter. Um, let's see. Yeah. So Mark Twain says there's three kinds of lies. Lies, damn lies, and statistics. I think you could just sub out metrics here. Um, because we all know that you can use data to basically prove any decision that you've already made. And this is what happens, I think, most of the time when we're using Google Analytics. We have an idea, we, we dig around through Google Analytics to sort of prove that our idea is accurate, and maybe we use, if we find something worthwhile, we use that as fodder in a presentation for our boss. Here's another illustration of um, how you might use data to uh, make yourself sound, oh, sorry, this is not the right screen. This is how you might use data to make yourself sound smarter. Um, Stats Canada, if you haven't been following them, is, is great. I highly recommend it. Hilarious! 47% um, of Canadians, oh, why is it going automatically? Okay, 47% of Canadian philosophers spend their days trying to answer the question, why buy a mattress anywhere else? <laughs> it sounds smart though, right? Like 67% of you right now just started following Stats Canada. That's yeah. a fact. So, vanity metrics. Um, vanity metric, how do you know, how do you smell a vanity metric? How do you know that, uh, uh, that you know, what you're tracking is actually a vanity metric? Um, there's a couple signs. One is they feel like a pat on the back, okay? So they make us feel good about ourselves when the number goes up, but when the number goes down, we start to blame some other source. You know, it couldn't be that our campaign didn't actually work if it's because of these external events or something like that. Um, they're dangerous because you can't, you can't actually trust them, and you know this in your heart of hearts that they're not actually trustworthy. Um, uh, you know, you show up in a meeting and maybe use them on your slide because they look cool, but at best, they, they only show correlation. That this number went up because I did this, you know, you're not, you're not too sure. Um, and 
you can tell because when you show them to people, they'll often say, yeah, but that's not really sound, or that's not really, you know, yeah, but this reason, you know, the, the sentence starts with yeah, but, and some explanation of why that metric's not valid. And the, the real danger, this is why they're really dangerous, is because what happens is when you're using vanity metrics, uh, and you're in a boardroom, you're making a decision, and you, you think you've got data to back yourself up, but really it's a vanity metric, um, the, what happens is just whoever the highest person, highest paid person in the room, uh, it really just falls back to whatever their opinion is. And it's not, you're not actually using data to make a decision, you're just sort of tricking yourself into that. So this sounds pretty depressing. Um, what can we do instead of that? And uh, the answer is something that, uh, like I said, Eric Ries coined, actionable metrics. And there's the three A's of actionable metrics. Actionable, accessible, and auditable. So let's break that down a little bit. Actionable metrics. Um, one, one test for an actionable metric is whether or not it's answering the most important question you have right now. Um, you need to, uh, you need to, you know, have a little bit of time to think about what, what is that question that we really as an organization need to answer. And it's not the opposite, which is go into Google Analytics, see if you can find anything cool, and then start making decisions based on some cool thing you found at Google Analytics, because it's probably not the most important thing um, for you right now, and you're probably going to waste time. So, you know, a couple of examples of how you figure out what's the most important thing to us. Uh, a lot of companies will look to the revenues. Is the revenues going up or down? Um, charities, you know, are donations going up or down? Um, you know, is awareness going up or down? What is the main thing that you measure success by in your organization? Maybe it's not, not those things, but you need, to, you need to figure out what that is. And the hint here is to focus on the macro, not the micro. It probably doesn't matter if your donate button is an orange or a green or a blue button. It, you know, you, you need to think big picture. What is it that we really want to really wanna measure? And accessible. So you, you can log into Google Analytics. Every one of you can. But a lot of people you work with are never going to do it. And they're never going to see the same data you see. They're never going to see those nice, fancy graphs and reports. And they're not going to be persuaded the same way uh, as you are. So how do you make this information that once you've decided this, these are the things we want to track, how do you make this information accessible? Um, so once you've decided what that one, two, three key, key metrics are, um, you need to start thinking about how are we going to make this so that all the decision makers in the room are now seeing this information. It could be very analog, right? It could be we're going to have a wall in our office and we're going to start tracking that metric on the wall. You know, so taking the uh, Google Analytics model and uh, going offline with it. And then not just can they see it and whether it's going up or down, but do they understand what affects that metric? Do they understand? Do um, various people in the organization understand how they can affect that metric to make it go up or make it go down, whatever the desired approach is. So you might have a metric that's accessible, you might have one that's really important to you, but if you can't reproduce the results time and time again, you're constantly going to have that, but what if, but what if our study wasn't quite right, or what if this metric isn't really telling us what we think it's going to tell us. So this, you, know, you have to apply the scientific method here in the sense that these results have to be repeatable. If they're not repeatable, then maybe you're not tracking the right thing or maybe you're not tracking it in the right way. Um, this, is, this is pretty high level theory on metrics right now, so I'm going through it pretty quick. And I'm going to have an exercise here that's a bit more tangible. So, so one last fourth point that I've just sort of added on to his three A's is that um, People matter, okay? So also, and that's what this last section of the presentation is about, is what we're tracking is actually people's behavior. We're not, we're not tracking clicks on a website. We're tracking how are people behaving and how do we want to change the way they behave. So, you know, if you think of, if you work for a charity and you are doing a fundraising campaign or you're doing, let's say you're doing an awareness campaign, what is the behavior you want people to have? 
you want people to share this with other people? Do you want people to um, sign up and create their own page? What is it, what, what behavior reflects the, the, the business goal or the, the goal of your organization? So take a little bit of a breather here, and if you've got some notes or if you just want to think about this for a second, um, you know, maybe write these down and maybe do them later. Um, so this is an exercise you could do right away. Okay, so based on the three A's, determine the three to five most important macro metrics for your organization. So you could do this tomorrow. Just sit down, think about what are the, nobody else can answer that. This is a strategic question. This is a business question. Nobody else can say these are the three generic metrics that everybody needs to track. So it's really going to be unique to your organization. So determine what the three to five, maybe it's only one. Some people subscribe to the fact that you should only have one metric at any one time and just get really good at tracking that one metric and get really good at affecting the behavior of that, that one metric. And then go back through the slides. The slides will be posted online and test them against the three A's, right? Is it actionable? Is it accessible? And can I get... Is it audible? Can I reproduce it time and time again? Um, some, of the, some of you may use Google Analytics already, and, and the metrics you want to track might be easily accessible in that. That's great. Um, you know, in order to track the metric you want to track, you might have to pay a little bit more for a software like Kiss Metrics or something along those lines. Or maybe the metric you track can't even be tracked online right now. Um, I would challenge people don't just like fall back on what Google Analytics can do. If the most important thing you need to track is actually something you just have to use like old school spreadsheets for, you should, you should try that and see if it works. Eventually try and get it online because it's going to be more maintainable that way, but um, think about the, what the most important thing is and then test them against the questions and then just try to determine what behavior is it that corresponds to those metrics, right? Is it somebody signing up, giving you their email address? Almost all of the time, in Google Analytics at least, these are gonna be goal and goals and events. This is just a, a tip for you if you're using Google Analytics. They're, they're not gonna be something you can just get by default. You're gonna have to set up a goal. And I'm not gonna go through the how, like I said, this isn't like a Google Analytics how-to, but if people are interested in that, I'm certainly happy to show you how to do that quickly after this presentation. But you're gonna have to learn how to set up a goal. And you'll have to, and probably all these metrics you wanna track are gonna be goals. Um, which is like a, a specific page that you, you want them to land on. Um, and, and there's tricks and things like that. So if you have specific use cases that you want to talk about after or in the question period, we could, we could dive into that. So that's, a, that's an exercise I would challenge you to do, uh, something you could do tomorrow. So let's assume that you've got your top three metrics and you're, and you're ready to go. Um, how does that help us actually make better decisions? That's the question. There's uh, three tools that we can use that help us uh, make decisions with metrics. Funnels, cohorts, and then a special kind of cohort called A-B testing, which some of you have probably heard of before. So a funnel is a series of events that represents a natural progression through some sort of flow. And in software, it's, you know, if you think of like a donation flow, it's so-and-so lands on the website, they see the donate button, they click it, takes them to the start of the donation form, they fill out the first page, they confirm their donation, and then they get a thank you email. Each one of those things that I described would be a different step in the funnel. And you could met, and what you'll see, a reason why they call it a funnel, is that over time, or through the funnel, you get you know, 100% of people starting up here, and over time, less and less people actually make it through the funnel. The idea is that there's no point in just like dumping new, con new contacts into the top of your sales funnel or new visitors into the top of your um, website e-commerce form or whatever if that funnel that exists after that first step isn't optimized because you'll just be throwing money away. Because how much does it cost to send out a newsletter and get people's eyeballs on that? It, it costs you something even, even if it's free. Um, so you have to try to optimize that progression that people are going through so you're not wasting money. 
Um, so an idea of a, a micro funnel, I guess I would call it, would be the, um, the donation process that you might have on a, on a particular website or an e-commerce e flow. Um, a macro example would be the whole user life cycle. The, the moment that somebody engages with your organization right on through until they die um, or they leave your organization for whatever reason. Um, that whole life cycle uh, is, is also a funnel. And uh, let's just have a pirate moment for a second. If everybody could with me just say, Arr! Arr! Okay, this is an acronym, and you may have heard it before. <laughs> Acquisition, activation, retention, revenue, referral. So if you can remember R, then you can remember this. Um, this is the user lifecycle funnel. That's pretty typical across um, various products, uh, nonprofit and for-profit. It, it really can be applied across the board. So at the, at the left, you've got 100% of users that are, you know, maybe it's landing on your website at some point. That's the acquisition, okay? Uh, and your key question there is where are people coming from? Uh, what, what we're gonna want to, what we're gonna start doing is looking here and seeing well, maybe these actually lead to some metrics that we might want to track, and I'll show that on the next slide. But the first step is users enter the flow, whether that's the macro or the micro, the user life cycle or that donation flow, and, you, and that's the acquisition. Activation is they've done something in, on your site, in your product, uh, in your organization that sort of shows that they're more than just an eyeball, they're actually, they've become engaged in some way. So on a charity site, maybe it's that they've signed up for a newsletter. Um, sign a petition. Sign a petition, yeah, something really, generally something pretty easy, but it shows that they've done more than just sort of like look at the content. That's a good example. Retention, uh, I think is obvious, but you know, are people coming back to the site? Once they've activated whatever that whatever you decide that is for your organization, are they coming back on a regular uh, basis? Revenue, uh, not necessarily have they given money, but have they given more money than it costs you to acquire them in the first place? This is this is more of like a software as a service terminology, but I think it's applicable to any to any organization. If you're a charity, you're spending a certain amount of dollars to get new donors. Um, if you are aware, purely awareness-based and there's no actual revenue, you have to sort of, you can sort of apply, because we're being analytical here, you can apply how much is it worth to have, have a activated, retained uh, activist. Uh, you know, how much is that worth to my organization? And I, how much did it cost me? And, and at some point, did, they, did I break even with them? That's the revenue point. And then referral is the really key, like, okay, so they've given you money, they, they, so they've sent out your email newsletter, they've, they've come back time and time again, and they've, you're actually, uh, you know, they're a very regular donor. Um, but would they be willing to say to their friend or family member, you should really check this organization out, you should really subscribe here? Are they sort of championing your cause on your behalf? This is, uh, this is what we mean by referral. So you could, this is the second exercise that you could take away from here. I, I wanna give you as many practical exercises as possible so that you've got something you can do after this. And uh, it might be a little hard to read, but you could, you could make a spreadsheet. Each color represents a different step in the, in the uh, funnel. And you, you describe what behavior is it that you want to see? Uh, what behavior describes that? So for acquisition, is it the number of people that visit your site? Uh, maybe. Maybe it's different for you. Um, activation. You know, here this person's got a couple things. Did they have a happy first visit? Did they stay on your site for X amount of time? Um, did they sign up for an account? Did they subscribe to the email? Uh, retention. Uh, and then, so I won't go through them all, but you can see here that uh, they've got some goals too, like what is our current, uh, how many, so it always starts with 100% and then you can start tracking how many people of those 100% uh, made it through the funnel 
to the bottom, and then you know by the end you're just down to like one or two percent typically. Usually, usually it's even less if you're just starting out measuring this. So does that feel like a, like something you could do, or does it feel like there's something like too challenging about that, too hard about that? Any any questions that seem a little? Is this this is just based on descriptive data? Well, no. This is probably plugged into an anal. This example here is most likely plugged into an analytics program of some sort. Like they're just copying and pasting from Google Analytics or something like that. Um, so that's the challenge. That's the challenge is once you figure out what it is, you got to figure out how to track it. And you're either tracking it online or you're gonna have to figure something else out. But the idea here is that it. It's worth tracking the right things. A few How do you of the get right the estimated things. Value. I guess you just have to sit down and figure that out. Yeah, uh, it might not be. That part might not be science. That part might just be a little bit of gut feel at first. Um, you, I don't even know if you need to, to do that to start with. The idea is, you once you've got this chart and you kind of show where you're at, you could say, well, actually, where you probably should focus your efforts is not acquisition. That might be one of the last places. You actually want to start on activation and retention. If, if you are working on a user, if you're thinking about this macro funnel, um, actually any funnel, uh, you want to start generally in the middle where people tend to fall off in greatest numbers. That's, that's the most common is the second and third step where people are going to fall off. Yeah. And what's the science around, around moving people through the funnel? Um, I don't know that, so it's not necessarily like, this is how the experience should feel. Right. Probably not. Uh, I don't know that people feel particularly good about moving, feeling like they're moving through a funnel. Rather, this is just a way for us to think about it. It's yeah, not, yeah, no, I was just interested if there had been, like, um, kind of analysis of what, right. what helps people, you know, what helps with retention, what helps with referral. What right, them. yeah. Yeah, that, that's good. Probably, I mean, we can we could chat about that a little bit more afterwards. Probably, get take me a little bit long to get into that. But um, once you it's marketing. Yeah, once you start. So yeah, we'll let I'll come back to that question yeah. if that's okay. Sure, yeah. yeah. Can I just ask one quick sure. question there? So that estimated value. Are are you saying that um, that I want to spend one cent to get somebody to visit the website, or I am willing to spend up to twenty five? sense to make right. them happy on their first visit? What is the... That's the value to you. Yeah, you kind of you got to figure it out backwards and you have to say, well, if we have a, for every thousand site visitors we have, we got a uh, hundred dollars in donations and you could do some math to say, well, every one site visitor was worth X number of dollars. That's not going to work out very well. Math so it's, so it's just estimating the value of your... Estimated value, yeah. yeah. What do you... I got you. Yeah. I wouldn't get too hung up on that column. This is just from the example that I use. But, yeah. Another question on estimated value. Yeah. Is uh, a lifetime value of a user um, the just the sum of all of that? No. But that's a, that's a good question. Uh, I mean, if you're really diving deep into this and if you want to learn more about it, then I would suggest searching for that exact phrase, uh, lifetime value of a customer. Uh, there are some calculations, like uh, there is actually an infographic I could share with you guys over email that would show, here's the, here's the mathematical formula for calculating the lifetime value of a customer or a donor or whatever. And uh, you could use that and then work backwards. That might be, I, I, think the, I think the answer is you, the easiest one is to figure out this is the value, this is the average value of a, a yeah, and then work your way backwards to say, well, because we have this many visitors, this is how much it's probably worth. And maybe these change over time. Like maybe the, maybe you want to see the cost, the estimated value of a, what, what you actually want to see is the estimated value of an, a, a site visit go up, go up. Because then you're going to be willing to invest more money in getting more site traffic, right? That's, it's not so much about saying this is what a site visit should be or shouldn't be. It's more about saying, this is what it is now, so is it worth me spending $650 to get in this next email blast of whatever? And then, uh, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll get into the bit more there. 
So that, that kind of brings us to the next one is, so what if you want to, um, you want to track how much your investments are paying off. So let's say you're investing in Google, uh, Google AdWords over here, you paid $600 to get on this one-time newsletter over here. Um, one of the ways we could do this is, is through co cohorts. So cohorts is a borrowed from social sciences. Uh, in social sciences, it's pretty common that they, if they're doing a test or they're doing some sort of study, they'll have you know co cohort A who experiences one thing, B who experiences another, and then a control group. So we're borrowing this idea of cohorts from science. And uh, some examples of cohorts that you might have already done uh, before and after tests. So um, you make a change to your website. If you are looking at your analytics before you've made that change and then after you've made that change, you're actually using cohort analysis to, because everybody who's visited your site before is behaving one way and everybody who's um, visiting your site is, is uh, behaving in a different way, then you can use that as a, as a decision tool. Um, time periods uh, might be another way to do that. Um, what, is, what does time periods mean? So, uh, if you are, if you're doing something in a two week period, and then you're doing something, it's very similar to before and after, but saying for this two week period, we're gonna test right. doing this thing, and for the next two week period, we're gonna test this thing. And then you can compare the two. Um, marketing sources, so you might say, everybody who's come and clicked through to our website from Google AdWords is one cohort. Everybody who's come to our site through uh, the newsletter that we send out is another cohort. And let's see how they behave differently. Is one more likely to donate? Well, then maybe you should invest more money in that. In that, so that's a pretty common, very easy to do thing uh, in Google Analytics for sure. Um, there's other more complicated things, demographic information. You don't get a lot of that in Google Analytics, so it's hard to do. So you you might have to pay for one of the premium products if, if that was really important for you to be able to break things up in terms of how do different seg. Audi uh, Market segments behave, um, but that's that's another way you could do it. Could you elaborate on priming? Oh yeah, so one example of cohort analysis is um, uh, if you've read the book Made to Stick, there's an example in there where they gave people an article to read, and uh, one article was emotional storytelling, and then another was. Um, Factual. Factual, yeah, very analytical. And then they asked people, and then they had another one where they, I think they read both. And then they asked people to donate. And the findings, I'm not, I haven't memorized them quite, but the story, the emotional one, people donated higher. Um, and the analytical one, people donated lower. And the mixed one, people actually donated just a little bit more than the lowest. So uh, the finding there, not really important to this talk, but was that... Uh, you know, emotional content helped. So what you could do for priming is if you had two landing pages, uh, and you could do that exact same example, what happens if we put a picture uh, and a story about this child in Africa, and on this side we put how, you know, a lot of numbers about how wells in Africa are affecting the population. Which performs better? One cohort would be the one that, uh, um, visited the emotional one, and the other would be the, the uh, analytical one. But you could do it with any sort of priming. Priming is just you do something first, and then you ask them see what, how they behave after that. Um, so based on some of these suggestions in the previous slides, think to your, this is another exercise you could do. Uh, think to yourself about uh, what are some of the relevant cohorts for your organization. Like, what would be useful? Is it marketing sources, or is it different groups of people that you want to see how, to beha how they behave? Um, and once you have an idea there, then, then you can start to make some plans of how you might test this. Probably the place to start is with A-B testing. And A-B testing is just cohort analysis, but it's very specific to you have two groups of people, you send them to a page, and randomly the page changes depending on you know, we use JavaScript and cookies. 
you don't have to know all this stuff. There's tools out there that'll let you do it. But the idea is you, you send them to a page, randomly it chooses which they get, version A or version B, and you can use this to compare in a hypothesis. Um, so typically what you'll do is A will be your existing web page, and B will be the hypothesis or the change that you've made to the website that you think is going to improve things. And by doing A and B, you can see how many people click on that donate or sign up button, and does one perform better than the other. Um, there's a big problem with all this testing. And uh, one of the things is that you need a lot of people to do it. You need, you need a, basically as a rule of, uh, I've got a link here in the presentation to a calculator that'll tell you how many people you actually need to uh, go through the, the test, but ballpark, you, you need about 100 conversions, right? So if you're testing something to do with donating, you need 100 people donating. If you're testing something to do with like email sign up, you need 100 people signing up. So for some smaller organizations, this can be pretty problematic um, to get 100 in a relatively short amount of time. Time. It's not impossible, but what it means is that you want to you want to make sure you're not wasting time. So if this is your first foray into A/B testing, don't test red donate button versus green donate button. Just make a choice. What you really want to ch test is like that headline, you know, for example, that headline message that everybody reads and nobody else looks at the, the rest of the site. That, that message, is that, is that on uh, target with what, they're, with what causes them to behave in the way you, you'd like them to? What is the biggest single change you can make to your website or to your landing page that's going to make a difference? And make sure it's your biggest one because if you go through all this effort and it takes you two months to get a hundred conversions and you get a sort of mediocre result out of it um, and you weren't testing for something that big anyways, you're going to be totally turned off by A-B testing. So you really have to think like, what is the biggest change I can make? And it's almost better if it's a little bit bold because you really want to make sure there's a difference between your, your A and your B. Um, the closer they are, you know, if you're like 50% of users are choosing, a, or 50, 49 are choosing A and 51 are choosing B, you're going to get a, basically a no result, no, no confidence result. So you, you want to make sure that the options you're choosing are going to make a difference in how people behave and that it's really important that you're willing to spend this time waiting for it and that you're going to actually be able to get 100 conversions. So if you can't get 100 donations to convert, try something else like something a little bit more low-hanging like um, email address. People entering their email address might be more realistic. So there's tools we can use to do this. Um, Google Analytics has a funnels tool. Um, when, you, when you go in there and you're setting up your goals like you've done in this previous step, there'll be an option to create funnels. Um, we can go over this after. Um, and you can do A-B testing with content, with Google's Content Experiment. Uh, that's the name of their product. Um, and then advanced segments are really helpful. So you can look at like your mobile versus your non-mobile traffic. You can look at um, different geographic regions. You could look at, uh, probably the most important is the marketing source. Uh, where are you spending your money and how are they behaving on your site. Uh, a really uh, good one that if you're sort of non-technical, it's going to cost you a bit of money, but if you don't have a developer who can help you with this stuff, optimizely, what it allows you to do is you just need a developer to copy and paste a bit of code into your website. Once that's done, you don't need to talk to a developer. You can, um, and I don't work for them, uh, You can. I just think it's a cool idea. You can... Uh, have your existing web page use sort of like a graphical user interface to like just like a word editor uh, to move things around, change images, change content. You don't have to know anything about HTML, and you can create your B version, and then and it does the whole test for you. And once you've got that up and running, there's a small monthly charge, uh, but you can do A/B tests without being a web developer. How does that compare to um, like 
unbalance score, uh, the Google Venture guys you were saying, Pino is, is a good one too? Yeah, Unbounce is a popular one. I'm not as familiar with that one. Unbounce, so the difference between Optimizely and Unbounce is Optimizely allows you to take a page that already exists on your website that you're already sending people to, like your homepage, and make some big changes to it without having to get your web developer to do it. And uh, just because of the JavaScript that runs in the background, it does it for you sort of magically. Unbounce is a little bit different in that you have to create a whole new page, a whole new website. Could you uh, repeat the questions? Oh yeah, so the question was, what's the difference between Optimizely and Unbounce, and what was the? The other one was Kino, but I think Kino. Kino's more of a, a okay. mock-up. Yeah. So I'll try and do that again in the future. So we've gone through how do you choose very quickly, I, I'm, I'm assuming, uh, we've gone through how do you choose the right metrics, right? So they've got to be actionable, accessible, and auditable. Now you've chosen the right metrics for your organization that nobody else can tell you what to choose, you have to pick. Uh, second step is you've sort of decided a, a framework for how are you going to test whether the metrics go up or down, right? So in these funnels, or in these A-B tests, we're, we're we're still measuring the same metrics. Did that donation, did the number of donations go up, did they go down? The same really important ones that we chose. And the, um, the last question I want to talk about tonight is how do you decide what to test? So if you're going to do some sort of A-B tests and you want to make some hypothesis and test that and have data to show, you just don't want to go on gut feeling if that's important to you, then how do you do that? Well you got to talk to people. This is the non-intuitive part, is you think, well, I'm testing something analytically, I'm, I'm, you know, this is all about data. And where it starts is actually with a bunch of analog conversations with people. You have to, uh, you know, if you want to test your, your charity's website, for example, you should get your friends and family to use the website in front of you, watch them go through that flow that you really want them to go through, and ask them questions. And, Watch where they get stuck, and you know, you know, act a little bit like a scientist observing all the things that they're they're doing right and doing wrong, and uh, we call this a usability test. Um, but you can do it without any fancy equipment. You can do it anywhere with a computer. You just uh, you ask the person to walk through this, and as they're doing it, you just take some notes. Another way to do it is to interview your own customers or um, supporter base or. or whatever it is, um, interview them and find out what they think. What do they think the problems are with your website or with your marketing materials or whatnot. And from that research that you've done, you know, you can talk to, the rule of thumb with usability testing is if you talk to five people, that's good enough. You don't need to, you'll probably learn more in five usability tests or five interviews that first time than you could act on in the next year. So um, do five usability tests and see uh, what they say. Sorry, why did you cross out focus groups and surveys? Oh, yeah. Uh, surveys aren't really good at this stage. If you're trying to figure out what metric or what um, hypothesis you want to make and test, then surveys aren't going to be a great way to do that because with surveys, you have to know the questions to ask. And you're not going to know the questions that... This is the... Survey is the, the way that we're probably most prone to do it because it's um, easy and... Uh, it doesn't involve us having to like leave our comfy office and that sort of thing. But surveys actually only tell us what we think we need to know. So we have to come up with those questions. And if we didn't come up with the right questions, then we're not, you know, we're kind of going to get misleading. They're going to tell us what we think already, basically. Same thing with focus groups. Focus groups are 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 prone to groupthink generally. Uh, that's why we avoid those as well, just because. Um, what your focus groups are good for maybe coming up with creative ways to solve problems, but they're not so good at being honest and truthful about the problems that currently exist. So that's the reason. So qualitative and quantitative. It's a bit backwards, but this is the way that it has to work because otherwise we're going to spend a lot of time doing A-B testing on blue and green buttons. 
Um, so here's an exercise. Talk to some people. Choose the method you want to use, you know, whether it's a usability test, if that makes sense, or an interview. And based on those, develop a hypothesis. You're going to learn so much stuff. Just choose the one most important thing you could possibly change on your website or whatever it is. And identify the relevant macro metric that's related to that. And now design an experiment using cohorts or funnels or A-B testing. Um, or you could just do another round of usability testing if, if that's still where you're at. Um, sometimes it's a good idea to do another round of usability testing just to make sure your hypothesis is, is something worth testing. And then what it comes down to is that metrics really, once we've made it, once we've made a hypothesis, but we really want that decision to be backed by fact and data, if we're, if we're completely happy with intuition, then we should just make the decision and move on. But if, we're ha if, we want, if for some reason this is a really critical decision, we think it's going to make a difference in our organization, then we should use data to, to actually prove that it's, uh, it's the right decision. And that's, and that's where the metrics and funnels and A-B testing all come into play. So I skipped over a lot of like the specific how to set up goals, how to set up funnels, how to set up cohorts, because I think that's really easy to just say, click this link, follow these 10 steps, and, and you can do that. Um, so I'll make sure that this gets sent out to the um, NetSquared community. And I guess I just want to open up for questions if we have time for that. Um, we do. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, so specific questions that maybe I, or the, were the ones that I skipped over that I said I'd come back to, that I didn't actually come back to. There's one more than that. Okay. How would you incorporate social media analytics as like a part of your overall analytics results? So the question was, how would you uh, incorporate social media into the overall analytics? Or into the funnels. In the funnels. Yeah. 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 So that's a, good, a great question. Um, when you're using social media sharing buttons on your website, um, there are tools out there like Add This, Share This. Um, they're, they're problematic in some senses, and, but they're great in others in that they track all of the data for you. So if you're not using one of those services, then I would suggest starting there. Um, and I would probably consider that uh, the social media stuff is going to be in one of the first two funnels of your user life cycle. Uh, it's definitely a way that you can acquire new people. Um, if you're using Add This, there's a sort of a, a metric you can track called viral lift. And so that might be one way to uh, look at that. Activation, might, maybe activation for you means that they've shared it with somebody. Don't confuse activation with referral, which is typically the last step. Um, Sorry, don't confuse social sharing with referral. Just because somebody shared something on social media is, is not, in this case, not actually the same thing as a referral. Because it's so easy to just click a like button or share on Facebook. What we're looking in the referral phase for is somebody who's like a champion for your cause or product. What was that word you used? Viral? Lift. Viral lift, I think, in ad, is an ad this term that um, it will tell you. Basically, it'll tell you how much, uh, how many clicks are you getting for that, for sure. That might be something to track. Good question. Did you make boxes for you? Pardon me? Did you make boxes for you? Mm. Did you make Oh, yeah. There you go. I can't remember what we were going to talk about after. Yeah. Think about it, and maybe it'll, we can chat, we can chat. I understand how you get to the evaluation of, let's say, 1,000 visitors leads you to one person to write 100 dollars. Um, but do you set up, do you use micro-conversions to lead to micro-conversions? And do you use a value to a micro-conversion? So let's say it takes, on average, three, you know, let's say 70 to 90 seconds on a page on a pod or a project yeah. is, and on average it takes three, you know, three, three projects to get a friend that there's only Uh, 
that's a good, good question. The way I'd answer it is it depends how... Can just repeat that question? Yeah, for sure. So the, que the question, if I can summarize it, is how do you uh, measure or put value on micro-conversions? Is that accurate? What's a micro-conversion? So, yeah, let me just uh, reiterate that. So a macro-conversion would be, like, the main goal of your site is to get a donation, to sell a product, to do whatever. Okay, so very obvious. X amount of dollars have been transferred. That's a macro-conversion. Micro-conversion might be something very small, like they shared, they viewed this page for X amount of minutes, um, they downloaded a, a certain file, like a PDF, these could all be micro conversions on their way to sure. ultimately whatever your end goal is. Um, so this is this is how I'd answer that question. It depends how mature you feel you are in tracking analytics. If you're just starting, I wouldn't be worried about micro. I wouldn't be worried about the micro stuff at all. Don't don't even bother. Like just like I was saying, don't worry about green or red buttons. Don't worry about the small little changes. Those tend to be the easiest to track, though, and so a lot of people do it. Not to say that it's not important, but you need to master the, the, big, st the big stuff first and figure out how you're affecting donations, if that's, if that's yours. Once you've figured out that you're tracking that really well, then you might start looking a level deeper, a level deeper. Only really mature companies with lots of traffic are really making decisions based on these micro metrics. That's, that's my two cents on that. There's a question over here, I think. Yeah. As you iterate through these uh, AP test grids and stuff, how much of a cost is the actual, like, performing the AP test, as we mentioned, for optimizing? Yeah. Sort of like the cost you're doing from something like that? Yeah. These uh, products usually sell for, they usually have some free um, element to them. So for Unbounce, I think you get 200 visits. But 200 visits isn't going to be enough to prove anything. So after that, the plans usually start around 50 bucks a month to 150 bucks a month. So if you're running the test for a month, then maybe it's only going to cost you $50. Sorry, the question was how much is it going to cost you? to do these A-B tests. Any other questions? Or? Yeah. Chris, how did you become so smart? Um, like, did you go to Chris University? Like, how internet. did you become wise in these ways? Uh, okay, so most of this is plagiarized. Um, none, of this is, <laughs> none of this is my own uh, ideas, really. Um, uh, I would encourage you to read books like uh, Lean Startup and um, Four Steps to Epiphany. If you're working, uh, what I find is interesting is if you're working in nonprofit and charitable sector, some of these books like Lean Startup and uh, Four Steps to Epiphany, which are like sort of mandatory reading in uh, entrepreneurial business, uh, are often missed. They just don't, for whatever reason, go through the same channel. So I would encourage you to, if you are in the nonprofit charity sector, try and get yourself. Um, steeped in as much business knowledge uh, and books and things like that that come up. So Lean Startup is one book I would recommend. Do you put any merit into offline experiments? Oh, for sure. And I think I mentioned that. Like, If you came to the conclusion that the most important metric you wanted to track actually couldn't be tracked online right now for whatever reason, or do it through a spreadsheet. Yeah, for sure. Uh, when I say offline, I mean, uh, like I've read Lean Startup, and yeah. you know, they talked about that one example where they started a, a pizza company or whatever, and so they were actually going out and doing the, the actual work uh, on a manual level and tracking. So uh, the example here is a passage from the Lean Startup about a pizza company that was doing all the tracking manually, um, and is that valid? I. 100%. I mean, I don't have a lot to add to that. I think it's a great uh, great idea if that's your most important metric. That, I mean, the, if I communicate anything, it's that we can so easily get bogged down in stuff that doesn't matter. So let's focus on the, the one metric that does matter. If that's, 
that's online or offline, it doesn't matter. Let's just figure out how to track that one thing really well. So what's the biggest mistake that you see people, nonprofits making when it comes to analytics? Well, the most common story is, you know, you get really excited about Google Analytics, you start exploring, and you, and you know, you, when you're first getting installed, and you're just like watching the hits come in, and you, and you just get really intrigued that way. And you spend maybe the first month that it's installed just like pouring through it, and then because there's nothing useful that comes of it, you just totally abandon. I'd say that's the most common. Um, the other is testing things, testing for things like red buttons, yeah. green buttons. That'd be the most common. We, I mean, we choose things that are, I think, by nature less risky. So. And who's doing it? Like, can you give me an example of somebody who's doing it really well? Um. I mean, most of this stuff is uh, done behind closed doors. There's sure. lots of uh, businesses that are doing it really, really well. I'm coming up blank on some examples. It doesn't matter. Um, Isn't there a great site called, like, Which Test One or something like that, which is not material material yeah. more for the business world, but does a lot of, like, here's two A-B tests, and, and sort of guides you through that step? Yeah. There, and, and one thing that just did come to mind is that there was a study done, I think the... The, it looked at the top ten charity sites, and they just sort of did the study, and uh, I think they looked at Oxfam and all the rest. And if I can find that, I'll include that with the slides. Yeah, the little website I just found it is called whichtestone.com, and it's like basically a regular stream of like cool A/B tests, and it'll blow your mind. And that was, I think, some of the stuff I was asking about was um, the science behind, you know, like you were yeah. saying that there's the emotion, the emotion trumps the. Um, yeah. The logic or whatever in terms of there, I guess that's something I can involve. There's another one here. I'll just uh, five second. Another one here, which uh, you can still do A/B tests, but if you wanted to do the A/B test even before it was live, you just had two mockups of say your homepage. Um, there's this uh, free website called Five Second Test, and you can run two types of tests. One is you ask them a question and you see where they would click. Another is they look at it for five seconds and then they tell you what they remember. This this is another very low cost way that you could you could do some testing prior to even releasing the code or launching the uh, the changes. Oh, that's not showing up online or on the. Brilliant. Yeah. So five seconds. Basically, you can just <coughs> upload two mockups and it will. Run an A/B test for you. And this will all be up in the right up. The yeah, I'll make sure to add that one and examples of A/B tests. We're gonna blow your minds with everything. We've got yeah. a nice little video of everything you've seen today with this gentleman's face all over it. Oh great! Plus, he may even share the slides. He's all that nice link yeah. you put up. Yeah. <coughs> yep. Share the slides. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your time.